few hours ago, this was someone's home. Not much left of it now, though, is there? Burnt out, charred, blackened by smoke, and what the heat and flames hadn't destroyed, the water used to put the fire out is reduced to a soggy mess. Someone's home. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Even the plaster has been scorched off the walls. But yet, in a way, the people who live here are lucky. You see, all they've really lost is some furniture. Many people lose their lives. Two minutes, 24 hours a day, day in, day out, the fire engines turn out to answer emergency calls. The newspapers, the television and radio have all the gory details. But can you honestly say you can remember even the last fire you heard about? Well, not everyone can. But every year, half a million people have very good reason to remember a fire, because they've had one. And sadly, 1,000 more will remember nothing, because for them, fire was a fatal experience. Now the aim of this film is quite simple. It's to give you a memorable fire experience the easy way. I'll warn you now that some of what you'll see is not pleasant, but then fire never is. You could at this point get up and walk out, but hiding from the truth will not stop fires happening. And surely it's better to learn from someone else's misery than from your own. <laughs> Friday morning, Sao Paulo, Brazil. The 25-story Huelma building blazes. Not a scene from the latest disaster movie, this fire was real. Devoid of any fire protection, it took but a few minutes for flames to engulf the lower floors. And people dashed for the only place they could, the roof. But fire burns upwards. Where do you run when there are no more floors to go and nothing to stop the fire coming after you? knows no mercy. A picture in tomorrow's paper, another number in the headlines. Some cling to life more tightly. But I wonder what she's thinking. Others find superhuman strength. And slowly but surely, this young man climbs down balcony over balcony, floor by floor. How many floors left to go? 10, 12, 20? to Brazilian fire codes unaltered since the 1930s and now people are paying the price of complacency with their lives. These two were among the lucky ones. Two 
227 more. Of course, all that happened 6,000 miles away. And as the people of Sao Paulo slowly recovered from the shock, those news pictures flashed round the world, making a lot of people feel rather uncomfortable. And also grateful that our fire regulations are far more stringent than those in Brazil. Fires like that simply couldn't happen here. But of course, they do. A busy shopping afternoon and a large city centre store blazes. Not the result of a terrorist bomb or a colossal gas explosion, perhaps simply nothing more than a discarded cigarette end. You don't have to be in a 25-storey building to find yourself trapped by fire. Just one floor up will do. A lot of the people in this store simply didn't take the fire alarm seriously, and some of them never even made it to a window. But what of the building itself? The store in which this fire occurred was, as far as the fire authority were concerned, safe, and would have been issued with a fire certificate to that effect in the near future. The fire started in an area where furniture was stored, as a small fire. Within one minute, it had spread beyond the control of first aid firefighting equipment which was provided in the store. Within two minutes, it had filled the second floor level with volumes of thick, black, high temperature smoke, which was extremely toxic. Whilst the building was safe, materials had been introduced which, when set on fire, developed so rapidly, ten people subsequently died. It could have been something as small as a match that started the fire, or an electrical fault, or anything similar. The effects of a fire starting in the area where it did would have been just the same from whatever cause. No fire authority, no amount of legislation can cover every eventuality. Just as the Titanic wasn't unsinkable, no building is ever totally fireproof. It depends very much on how we treat it and what we put into it. The risk factor may alter, but from factories to farms, from hospitals to homes, they will all burn if we allow the right circumstances to develop. And even when your home is a castle, that's not immune either. But if our buildings are constructed properly, where do we keep going wrong? The whole attitude of the public is very casual. The only people that really think fire is a serious uh, threat to them are people that have had one. I think the first two or three minutes are the most crucial in a fire uh, when the person who's discovered it has got to decide what they're going to do. Are they going to run and shout for help? Are they going to try and tackle the fire? Are they going to just shut the door and leave it and call for the fire brigade? And we generally find that by the time we've got there, if the person has panicked and done things wrong, it makes our job very much more difficult um, to put the situation right in the quickest possible manner. There are probably a million and one different ways in which a fire can begin. And although stopping it from ever starting is plainly the safest way of going about things, I hope we've convinced you already that no matter how hard you try, there's always the chance that someone or something beyond your control might start the fire for you. So being prepared for a fire is very important. Actually, that's not quite as demanding as you might think. Take a look at this model. It's a fairly typical hotel, office block, hospital, or your home even because the principles of fire protection are very much the same no matter what kind of building you're dealing with. I'll take the front off. You might get some idea what I'm talking about. 
so the walls of this structure, of course, are not going to burn by themselves. But as we've heard, just about everything we've put inside, from the paint on the ceiling to the carpet on the floor, and all the fixtures and fittings in between, they will burn. Now, obviously, it's not practical to live or to work without at least some of these items. Neither is it possible to make everything in there fireproof. In short, what I'm saying is that we all need to live and work in environments that could be classified as a fire risk. The thing to remember is don't automatically assume that you're safe and that someone else has got all the problems. Remember, this is your office, your factory, your home. Let's start a fire. A fire can start just about anywhere, but particularly dangerous are fires that start in those out-of-the-way places, like storerooms. Unnoticed, a small spark has time to develop and grow into something far more serious. But a fire has to breathe, and starved of air, this room will fill not with flame, but with superheated smoke, and gases hot enough to scorch lungs in a single breath. Outwardly, it doesn't seem too serious. But open the door on a fire like this, let air in, and it literally explodes into life. Fatality number one. Strangely enough, this fire is still quite small, but look at what's happening. That smoke is deadly, and before these two have time to respond or even think about the situation, they'll be asphyxiated. Fatalities two and three. Smoke spreads far faster than flame, and because doors have been left open, there is nothing to stop it now, rushing along corridors, upstairs, involving rooms and people hundreds of yards away. This smoke is white, but in a real fire it's thick, black, pungent. And as anyone who's been in a fire will tell you, smoke is a killer. This is our bed half naked, and it comes round here. I see the smoke belching out, so I get into the house, dash it upstairs, and I'm hit by a hail of black smoke, you see. I get to my belly, and uh, the next thing I get a lung full. I try another. Uh, I try again to get to bed, but I can't. So I come down, and and father of course tries to get up again. He's, in, he's panicking. He's been. He's tried several times before that. And I see him getting a lung full, and he to, he comes down. So I thought, well, I'll try one more time. Uh, I get again to, near, near to bed, I couldn't see any kids about. And I just saw edge at bed burning and edge at skirting board burning. Hmm. But you... <laughs> <laughs> More people die through the inhalation of smoke and other toxic material than, than indeed the people that die through direct contact with fire itself. Um, smoke is very, very toxic, particularly with the modern materials that we have nowadays. And uh, it isn't just a matter of taking a deep breath and leaving the room. The products of combustion are very, very harmful. And even with a few lungfuls, people have been known to die later on. So if you find yourself in a situation like this, you'll need every bit of luck you have to survive. And all because of just one little fire. And this isn't, as you might suppose, an unprotected building like the one in Sao Paulo. Merely a protected one, abused to the point where the protection is almost worthless. What the fire brigade like to try and achieve is compartmentation within the building. And ideally, we'd like to keep the compartments as small as possible. And if we can keep that compartment small, we're going to keep the fire contained to a small area within the building. Now you remember I said this was a protected building. Well, even without fire extinguishers or fire alarms, it still offers some of the very best protection available. I'll explain that. 
If you look inside, you'll see that all the offices and corridors, they all form little boxes, or compartments as the fire brigade call them. And if the doors are closed, then each one of these compartments is literally sealed off from the others. Now the planners and the fire authorities go to great lengths to make sure that all the doors and walls and ceilings can contain and withstand a fire for a matter of several hours. The only way of letting that fire out is by making a hole in the compartment, and leaving the door open does just that. Right, let's restage our fire now, but this time we'll do it with the doors closed to give the protection a chance. It's worth mentioning that with the door left closed, the fire would eventually smother itself. But let's suppose our friend still makes the same mistake. Well, there's little that can be done for him. The fire will still flash over just the same. But with doors closed, only two compartments are involved. And these people now have time to sound the alarm and evacuate the building quite safely. Uh, Fire doors are there for two reasons. One is to compartment the building and prevent the spread of fire, and the other is to provide a safe means of escape for those people that occupy the building. The best piece of advice we can give anybody, whether it is in a factory, an office, or in the home, is to close doors. Any door is good by perfection. Any door is better than no door at all. Even in the house, a normal panel door will hold flame and heat back for about 20 minutes. So any door that's closed, I look at as being a fire door. This bedroom door undoubtedly saved a life. The lounge has been almost totally destroyed. The stairs and landing too have been devastated. And even though the outside of the door itself has been badly burnt, a coat hanging on the inside isn't even scorched. But these special fire doors prove to be useless at this hospital. When a patient decided to set fire to his bed, thick toxic smoke completely filled more than 800 meters, nearly half a mile of corridors. But the doors were useless only because they'd been left open. On that occasion, they were lucky. None of the 500 patients and staff was harmed. But how long before the memory fades and bad habits take over again? We're all guilty of bad habits, to some extent. Like turning a fire escape into an obstacle course with rubbish. And rubbish, it seems, is one of the hardest things for fire planners to cater for. This chute must have seemed like a good idea at the time. Fine, until you let the skip overflow and then any vandal with a match can put your life at risk. But what about these people who like to pile rubbish up right on their own doorsteps? Perhaps their only way out in an emergency. A trolley carelessly parked prevents this fire door from doing its job. It's supposed to close automatically in the event of a fire. Once you start accepting things out of place, you've started to accept a lower standard of fire protection. Lives can be lost through nothing more than a lick of paint. A wooden wedge. Hanging your coat in the wrong place. All for the sake of a few extra feet of storage. The cost of saving lives, on the other hand, is nothing more than giving a thought to fire safety and having respect for the fire equipment around you, and perhaps giving five minutes of your time and a little bit of effort. Five minutes isn't a lot of time. Sometimes it isn't long enough. When we opened the door, the whole banister was ablaze, there was thick black smoke, and uh, then the lady of the house came to the window she was shouting at work, so we climbed up onto the ledge and I took the kid down. My father went up and he grabbed the... I had a man handle out the window and it, it was just like handling in a dummy. It was, uh, it was only when I lowered, lowered her down, must have come out, it come out of uh, the shop she was in and uh, started shouting, home me baby, home me baby. By then... 
Sure that too. Yeah. yeah. But had I had that bloody five minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm not possible to make this to the bloody chance. I just had five minutes. It can almost be guaranteed that in times of need, someone from somewhere will come forward and risk his life for others, no matter how hopeless the situation. Firemen just get on and do the job without complaint, no matter how badly we stack the odds against them. But how would you feel knowing you were responsible for this? Responsible because you couldn't be bothered to close a few doors. Because you couldn't be bothered to clean away a bit of rubbish. Someone else has to pay the price. Even for firemen, fires are dangerous. One wrong move and as well as fighting to save your life, they can end up fighting for their own. And in the 20 minutes or so it's taken to tell, at least a dozen emergencies will have been attended to by the various fire brigades. Chances are that by the time the day's out, three people will have died. We said at the start of the film that if you wanted to avoid reality, you needn't watch. Okay, you've stayed with us, you've watched various people's misfortune, you've seen various people's deaths. In these 20 minutes, I hope we've been able to show you how awful fire can be. We've shown you office fires, factory fires, house fires. We've proved too that even though a building has fire extinguishers, fire doors and fire alarms, it's not necessarily safe if you gradually destroy that protection. For some unexplained reason, many people seem to think that fire prevention is something rather complicated, something someone else has to arrange. Well, it's not. It's simply a matter of you getting into little habits. Habits like closing the door, like not allowing piles of rubbish to accumulate, like unplugging the television set at night, like taking the trouble to find out what all those little bits of fire equipment are for. If we all get into these little habits, then the number of fires will be significantly reduced. If we don't, then one thing can be guaranteed. Some of you watching now will have a fire. It may be in 10 years' time. It may be in one year's time. It may be tonight. So give yourself a chance. South. But you... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, had I had 25 minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm not possible to make this to the bloody chance. <laughs> 